So, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, I am very, very excited to host you. Because the last time I did it, hello. We are very happy to see you. Uh, I guess that the guys without the camera are still in bed in Israel. Shnat. We call it Shnat, Olivia. So, we yeah. have some English speaking. Guest today, so we will uh, practice your English. And Olivia is a teacher here at the Overseas Family School, so try not to make too many mistakes. But uh, she she handles with me, so she will be okay. Um, so I don't know some of the names here. So I'm Karni Sommer, food explorer, and I lived in Singapore for 10 years. I came for half a year, but the food was so good, so I decided to stay more. Uh, I have three kids, and I have a company named Walk and Stroll, which is a company for culinary adventures in Singapore, or food tours. Unfortunately, since uh, Chinese New Year 2020, or end of January, I found myself, how would I say, between jobs, or unemployed, without any uh, tourists that will join me for market tours and uh, other experiences. So uh, since then, I'm back to my food. Oh, there is some noise. Is it from me or from someone else? So uh, since then, since the corona came to our life, uh, I'm uh, in, inside the kitchen cooking all day. And as I like people and not only cooking, so I started to host my colleagues from around the world doing food tours and uh, cultural tours uh, in the world. Maybe next uh, week we will host some local chefs here in Singapore in Foodies in Asia, which is the, the community that I uh, manage. And today we are hosting Itai. So I know Itai since we were together in club and in the scouts. But since uh, we went each one to the army and... Uh, I think since we were 18, we, we like it broke, broke touch. Yeah, so uh, we, um, the next time I met him was in a foodie group online. Uh, so anyway, this is about me, but today we're talking about Itai. That speaks three or four. Yala. Let's start. Four. Lechaim. Lechaim. So my name is Itai Novik. I'm originally from Israel, as Kani said. We know each other from uh, school, from the third year. And uh, I live in Berlin, but I lived before in Italy. I lived in Milan. So I left uh, Israel in 2005. I studied in Italy, um, industrial design. I lived in Milan for six years and been living in Berlin since 2011. I have uh, my own band for culinary tours in Berlin. I'm doing culinary tours and other things. I will explain in a, in a few minutes. And um, I just celebrated five years yesterday, yesterday, five years anniversary for my brand for Elements of Food. Um, Cheers, everyone. Hi. I hope everyone has a drink with him. Yeah. Inside the Eyal that has ice cream, but okay. It's uh, good enough. Gelato. <laughs> So, um, as Kani, I also found myself uh, in between jobs. Um, <laughs> my last tour, I think, was on the 29th of, uh, of February. Uh, and it, because it was, a, it was a German tour, so it was locals. Uh, so people were, who were still, I mean, were still here in Berlin. But we don't, all, we don't have tourists basically from the end of February. So, I mean, that was like the week. From the end of February until the start of March, that was the week where everything was cancelled. And I'm also doing now, right now a lot of online activities. Um, I'm doing my own talks, um, not international, international, but more uh, Berlin uh, oriented. So I host uh, chefs and people from the culinary scene in Berlin. Uh, I'm trying to do it weekly. Um, I did it last week, we did it with uh, Gal Ben Moshe, who Gal is quite, I mean, he's now one of the hottest chefs in uh, Berlin, because he just won the first Michelin star two weeks, uh, one month ago. And two weeks after that, he had to close his restaurant, of course, because due to the corona uh, uh, issue. 
So, I mean, it was very interesting, of course, to talk about that. You can also find it online. I will show later, I have a, a presentation and I will show later everything about that. Um, yesterday, I did, I mean, there's a lot of, everything goes online now. So yesterday I did a cooking class or a cooking workshop uh, for the synagogue in uh, Berlin uh, because the Mimuna, which is the uh, holiday that finishes Passover, the Jewish uh, Passover, <coughs> that was on Wednesday. But Berlin is a city with a wall and therefore uh, in Judaism we celebrate one day more. So there's one day more with, when you are not allowed to eat flour and therefore the uh, holiday in Berlin ended up only yesterday. So we did Mufleta. Mufleta is this kind of pancake which you do just after the holiday, after the Passover. Uh, but I, did, I came up with the idea, I mean, we are in Germany, so let's make a Black Forest Mufleta. So I don't know if everybody knows this cake. Uh, it's a very iconic cake from uh, South Germany. Uh, chocolate sponge cake with a lot of cream and with uh, cherries and some uh, cherry uh, brandy. And so we did the Mufleta, but Black Forest way. So you can also see it on my Facebook if you want later. Uh, that was an ex uh, quite a unique ex experience. Um, we're going to talk today about the food. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Berlin and an issue that I deal with a lot is uh, what is regional food, what is regional food and what in, in general, I mean, what is regional. Uh, I think there are some similarities between Berlin and Singapore, I guess, which is kind of funny to say because Berlin is like a Babylon of cultures. We have uh, people from 200 different nations in Berlin. Uh, about, uh, I don't know, more than 100 uh, languages uh, being spoken in the city. Uh, food comes from everywhere, of course. And there are things which are considered to be regional and things which are not considered to be regional, even though they are maybe regional, but I will get to it later. So uh, I'm going to talk about what is regional and also about, um, about uh, what you can get in Berlin. Uh, I'm starting with what I do. So I'm doing, as I said, I'm doing food tours uh, about Berlin culinary history, about regional food, and I, but I also have a catering. Um, I have, a, I, I used to say I have a small catering, but it's actually grew quite a lot. So I did also quite big. I mean, I'm doing also big, bigger events. Uh, I'm doing like, for example, the. Um, the sponsorship for the Israeli Film Festival in Berlin, it's about 300 people each year. I'm doing it for the last two years. Let's see if we, will, if we can still do it in this September. Um, I'm doing the ITB, if you know, the International Tourism uh, Fair in Berlin. That's the biggest in the world. And I'm doing the, I did the um, catering for the Israeli uh, ministry, uh, Tourism Ministry for two years. Uh, but I'm also doing more conceptual events and I will get to it later because we are also doing some food. So, um, and I will talk about that later. I'm doing food styling and uh, food videos. And I'm doing also um, uh, pop-up events. So more conceptual events. Um, let's talk about, um, about German food. So I don't know how many of you have seen uh, German uh, food painting before. Uh, but this is, for example, this is the Renaissance. Um, food painting was a big thing in 1500, 1600. And it's also a very good way for, uh, for us today uh, to analyze and to see what people used to eat at the time. These pictures are, of course, not from Germany. And now I will show you pictures of how German uh, painters used to, um, um, this, used to, to paint food. So these are, uh, this is uh, Georg uh, Flegel uh, from around 1600. And these are typical German food um, paintings from 1500, 1600. And you can see um, an egg, a beer or a white wine, uh, a bread, um, some root vegetables, but it doesn't look very, very appealing. And in general, uh, until maybe the past 10, 20 years, 
food was not a, a um, central uh, a central uh, thing in the German culture. Whoever is beeping, if he can mute himself, that will be very nice. Um, so G German, uh, German in general, German culture uh, was not famous for its food. It's food. There are, I mean, I lived in Italy. Italian culture, Spanish culture, French culture, they were all very, very, uh, food was very fundamental. It was a center of what, I mean, what unite the state. And Germany is not like that uh, because it's not Catholic. Uh, it's a Protestant culture. It's very humble. It's very modest. And also the um, nature is very poor in this area. It's very cold. And um, there are a lot of things which you can find in other countries in Europe, which you can't find in Germany. And therefore, food was in general not a, a, main, uh, a main topic in German culture until the, past, until the last 20, uh, 20 years, maybe. Uh, what can we find in Germany? So, here you can see, of course, I made it a bit more, um, a bit more um, caricaturistic. But this is the type of food you can find in Germany, at least what is defined as uh, German food. So uh, the, the black forest cake, which you can see in the center, uh, we have potatoes, of course, a lot of potatoes, a lot of sausages, and a lot of pork. Uh, in general, there's, much, there's a tendency to eat much more pork than other uh, animals in German culture, mostly because it's much cheaper, uh, pork meat, uh, much cheaper than beef, for example, and also the landscape. I mean, in general, uh, at least north of Germany, uh, until 1500, maybe a bit, uh, a bit, um, yeah, until 1500, about 1500, most of the landscape was basically forests. So there were not a lot of open um, fields which you can grow uh, meat. Um, in Berlin, Berlin is in the north of, uh, of Germany, <clears throat> and uh, so the landscape is even more poor. I mean, the um, richer, uh, the richer uh, regions of Germany are in the south of Germany, especially uh, Bayern, which is, Munich is the capital of Bayern, uh, and uh, the area of uh, Schwarzwald, so uh, the area of Black Forest uh, to the border of France. That's the two more uh, fertile uh, areas of uh, Germany. In Berlin, the landscape is quite uh, poor. Uh, it used to be a big swamp, basically, until 1300. There was uh, quite a big swamp around here. The, there are still a lot of forests, but the, uh, the land itself, the soil, is not very fertile. What can we get here? As I said, pork. Uh, there's a lot of cabbage, and it doesn't sound amazing. But uh, cabbage actually is one thing that Germans actually know how to grow really, really good. And there are quite a lot of uh, types of cabbage. Uh, Brandenburg, so the area, the area around Berlin is famous also for apples. And a lot of grains, but not uh, wheat, but mostly um, rye. We have a lot of rye and wheat. What you don't see in the picture, and that's not uh, by accident, is potatoes, because potatoes until 1700 were not part of the German culture, actually. Like with uh, tomatoes in Italy, like with eggplants in Italy, uh, like with most other things like pumpkins, uh, they all come from, uh, from Central America, and therefore until 1500, 1600, nobody knew these uh, this vegetables uh, or uh, fruits uh, in, um, in Europe. Uh, potatoes, arrived to Berlin or to Germany <coughs> around 1700. And the one responsible for it is this guy over here. Anybody know him? Frederick, uh, Frederick the Great? Uh, very central um, king um, in Germany. Uh, at the time there was no Germany because Germany was established actually much later in 1870. But uh, before that it was divided into small kingdoms. And one of them was Prussia. Prussia was the kingdom that later you, you, uh, united the, all of Germany, and its uh, capital was Berlin. So uh, Frederick the Great was the uh, king of Prussia, and his uh, palace was in Berlin. He had also a summer palace outside of Berlin, but that's the area where he sat. 
And uh, Frederick the Great is not only called like that, he is called for many reasons the Great, but he is also the one who introduced potatoes to Germany. And at the time, like with uh, um, aubergine, like with, uh, uh, like with the tomatoes in Italy, nobody wanted to eat actually uh, potatoes because it was considered to be something poisoned, uh, a fruit, uh, vegetables that you have to cook that is poisoned before and you can't really eat it as is. And uh, therefore a lot of people, I mean, most people wouldn't uh, touch it. And what Frederick did, he planted it um, around his palace and he put the guards on, uh, on the fields. And he told the guards, you should guard it as if it's the most, uh, ex uh, it's the biggest treasure we have. But at night I want you to stand off. And if the farmers go inside at night and start uh, taking plants from the, from the field, I want you to let them do it. And that's how it spread actually. I mean, that, that's how uh, people started to eat uh, uh, potatoes in Germany because uh, people started uh, to think, okay, if the king uh, uh, thinks it's so valuable, so we have to try it also. And it sounds maybe like a legend, but it's a true story. And um, you can see it until today, because on his grave is buried outside of Berlin. The people, when they come to pay their respect, they always bring potatoes, and you can see it always, there are potatoes on his grave. He, by the way, he didn't have any children, and he's buried in his uh, summer palace with his 11 dogs. So there are 12 graves, he is, and, and 11 graves, uh, graves for his uh, hunting dogs, which were buried with him later. Uh, we have quite a lot of potatoes in uh, Germany. Um, there are a few hundred uh, types. Uh, on the right side, you can see the uh, most uh, ancient uh, commercial um, uh, species in Germany today, which is the Bamberger Honschen. Uh, it doesn't look so amazing, but it's actually very tasty. It's been in Germany since 1830. There's no commercial um, um, type of potatoes which is older. Uh, it has a European Union, today it has a European Union uh, um, uh, certificate because it's a historical, uh, it's an historical uh, type of potato. Uh, all German potatoes has names of females actually. So you can see, it, I mean, it's all of course German uh, females, but you can see Laura and Linda and there's Zieglinda and Gilena. Uh, really, they are all uh, names after women in Germany. Um, Laura was a, uh, Laura is my favorite basically. I don't have Laura today because we are going to cook later um, dumplings. Uh, I did it with potato yeah. filling, but I didn't get. I didn't get Laura. Uh, Laura is has a red peel from the outside and a very, very yellowish um, uh, meat inside. And it's really, I think it's the best, oh. it's the perfect potato, actually. If you are in Germany, this is one thing you have to try, potatoes. Um, that's another one, Silena, but it's only from 18, uh, 1981. You can see a lot of them are actually quite new. I mean, a lot of them are from the recent 20, 30, 40 years, not more. Um, because there were a lot of developments in this field in Germany. I'm going a bit faster because I want also to show you some other things later, not just potatoes. And that's, that's what I already said. It doesn't look amazing and people today don't know it. And they start, I mean, because it looks like it needs a lot of, I mean, you need to peel it and it's a lot of uh, hassle, but you actually don't need to peel it. You can cook it as is and it's really the perfect potato salad um, with this one. Um, one more important thing in uh, Berlin uh, food culture is the closed market, the market halls. Uh, the market halls until 1800, 1850, there were no market halls in uh, Germany, in Berlin, in Berlin area. It was all um, open market, open air market. And around 1890, they started, the city started to build uh, covered markets. And so it was a really big chain of, of uh, closed hall uh, market halls. There were 14 of them. Uh, on the right side, you see the central one, which was destroyed in the war. Most of Berlin actually was destroyed during the Second World War um, and between uh, 1939 and 1945. 
And um, also the, we have a lot of department stores, still historical ones that uh, still exist till today. KDV is a very famous one. KDV uh, is on the left side. It's from 1900. It's a department store of seven uh, floors. And it has the second biggest uh, food court in Europe. Uh, the first one is, um, is um, okay. Edwards, I think, in uh, London. And KDV is the second one. It has they import food from all over the world. If you are ever in Berlin, this is definitely something you have to see. Uh, Karstadt on the, the, um, on the right side, that's a very famous German brand for a uh, department store chain. Uh, historical one, you can see it's from 1881. Uh, also quite a lot of big department store. This department store is basically something that was very popular in Berlin around 1900. Um, these are some examples of the uh, market halls that we can still find today. The, there are not a lot of them, as you can see. On the right corner um, up, you can see, for example, um, you see uh, a remain. I mean, it's basically, I don't know if it's even one quarter. I mean, it's a small part of the old uh, market hall uh, in Kreuzberg. Kreuzberg is um, quite a famous neighborhood in Berlin. I will show you the map in a second. Uh, so these are all market halls that um, are still, um, that you can still find in Berlin. Uh, this is Berlin. Berlin is quite big. Berlin is actually the second biggest after London in Europe. It's about 900 square meters uh, divided into different neighborhoods. And because it's so big, so each neighborhood is actually functioning as its own city. Uh, each one has a mayor and a council, and there's a, one mayor for the whole of Berlin, and he sits in Mitte. Mitte is in the middle of the map. It's the um, center of the city. And because Be Berlin is very, very, um, not very central, um, we have east and west also. We had east and west until uh, 30, uh, until 89, so until uh, 30 years ago. Uh, the city was still divided between the two cities. So each neighborhood basically in Berlin has its own character and it's very, very different. I live in Neuken, for example. Neuken, you can see in green down the map. Uh, it looks like it's East Berlin, but it actually used to be West Berlin because the, div the division was not, uh, not one line. Um, and it's an uh, immigrant uh, neighborhood. It's very, very young. Also, uh, Kreuzberg, Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, which you can see just um, um, below Mitte, between Mitte and Neuken, there's Kreuzberg and Friedrichshain. Uh, these are two very young neighborhoods in Berlin, very, very, a lot of immigrants, a lot of young people, a lot of new and old immigrants. Um, Charlottenburg on the left side in pink, uh, that's the old west, so the, old, the city center of old uh, West Berlin. Um, you can, um, and there you find also the more established uh, places. I will show you some pictures from the later. Um, let's, uh, everybody I guess knows that Germany is big on sausages. Uh, any of you know uh, what uh, currywurst is? Somebody? No? Yes, we even discussed with the term one I had. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, you were at my tour. Yes. I, um, I lived in Wisconsin in the U.S. for about three yeah. years, and a lot of the sausages they have there are because are, are very similar to the German ones because mm. it's such a, they, they're all the German immigrants settled in Wisconsin. Yeah, so, yeah I know. I know about Texas, right? Like Texas is big on German um, culture also. Um, so this is Hertha Hoyer. Eta Hoya is, I mean, it's, she is not very famous outside of Germany, especially outside of Berlin, but the name is in Germany, or at least in Berlin, is very famous because she came up with the most Berliner, Berlinish uh, food, which is the Currywurst. Uh, Currywurst is like, it's iconic. Everybody that visits Berlin has to taste it. Currywurst is basically a sausage with a lot of uh, sweet, sweet ketchup uh, sauce and then a curry powder on top. Uh, it doesn't sound very German, but this is actually the most iconic thing you can find in Berlin. And everybody that goes to Berlin knows he has to try it. 
and her daughter is the one actually uh, she came up with this recipe and um, she did it in 1949 um, 1949 yeah uh, on the map here you can see east and west berlin uh, Hertha Hoya lived in uh, Charlottenburg, so in the British sector at the time, because it was divided after the war, after the Second World War. Um, and she came with the idea, ah, so, so she came with the idea of um, making it with uh, ketchup and uh, curry powder. Uh, until then, sausages in Germany were always served only with mustard. I mean, mustard is a big thing in Germany. And the most uh, famous uh, master in Germany actually come from Bautzen. I guess nobody heard about it, uh, unless you're German. But uh, in Germany, it's quite famous. Uh, Bautzen is um, in the middle of Germany, and it's the capital. It's the master capital of Germany. Uh, but the thing is that uh, Bautzen uh, used to be in East Germany, and in 1948 until 1949. West Berlin was actually um, isolated from the rest of uh, West Germany and in general from, especially from uh, East Germany because Berlin in general is located in the eastern part of Germany. So at the time in 1948, there was a short shortage of mustard in Berlin actually. There was no mustard in Berlin in 1948, 1949 because all the mustard basically coming from uh, East Germany so they didn't have mustard at the time. What did they have? They had a supply from the American and from the uh, British Army. Uh, so from the British Army, they, they had a lot of curry powder because everybody knows, I mean, the British cuisine is very, very, um, it's famous for its uh, Indian curry. And uh, they had ketchup from the Americans. And these two ingredients that I took and she uh, mixed them and started serving it with the sausages. Uh, she had a sausage stand, and uh, this actually became a hit. I mean, she uh, even um, she even uh, wrote the secret formula um, ten years later, and she put the name on it. But the name, I mean, the brand that she came up with was uh, um, it was called uh, catch not ketchup something like that. I forgot the name right now, but it was not called Kuivos, which is the name that everybody knows it until today. אני הולכת להפריז עכשיו להוציא פה נקניקיות ולערבב אותן. I'm going to mix now the coffee I have at home with hot dogs. Oh my goodness, I can send you the recipe later. Okay. Put a lot of sugar inside, by the way. I like sugar. Shirley, go defrost some hot dogs for for late dinner. Olivia, you can join. I will do delivery. We cannot eat together, but at least we can uh, share some. <laughs> you can do a takeaway. Yeah, for sure. So, so she's so she's the one that came up with this idea, and actually, I mean, it was a big deal. Uh, at the seventies, uh, she had a twenty-four-seven daily uh, diner, and she closed around in the eighties. She retired for pension. She was quite, I think, she was quite a, a wealthy w woman in the end of her career. Um, that's the statistics for how many currywurst are eaten in Berlin uh, each day. So 10,000 for a week. Uh, in, I don't know. It's in Berlin, not in Germany. Uh, so 10,000 sausages are eaten in Berlin in a week. Uh, in Berlin, uh, can you say it? You want to say it? I didn't, I can't read it because uh, my chat is off. I said, that in, I said that in Berlin you can even get vegan curry wurst, which I had, made from tofu, yeah. I don't, but I, I don't know if they counted them in the... Mm, that's a good system. question. <laughs> I, I think not. I don't think that it's... Mm, I have to check it out, actually. I mean, I'm not sure that it's considered to be in the statistics. <laughs> so there are 10,000 for a week. Uh, 10,000 sausages eaten in Berlin for a week. Uh, 800 million uh, per year. And... Ah, sorry, and 70, uh, eight, 800 million uh, in the whole of Germany and 70 million only in Berlin each year. Uh, if you would go to the Inchalodenburg with me, I can even show you, I mean, she got a shield. Uh, they put a shield on the house where the uh, stand used to be. Um, and that's, as I said, I mean, that was considered to be the very uh, essence of what is German food, at least in Berlin, um, until today. 
And as I said, I want to refer to what is regional food. So this is considered to be very, very regional. And uh, let's talk about another regional food, which is not considered actually to be uh, regional. It's still considered to be something from, uh, Im uh, considered to be immigrants uh, food, which is the Dunao. The Dunao, uh, so the Turkish um, uh, meat school, uh, which is served as a sandwich in Berlin, not as a, a plated uh, dish. Tony, if you want, uh, that I don't think you can actually make my own at home. And uh, the donor, everybody, uh, if you've been to Istanbul or to Turkey, so probably you ate a donor. Uh, in, in Turkey, it comes always as a plated dish or most of the time as a plated dish. It comes with rice, it comes with a tomato, um, with uh, beans cooked in tomato sauce on the side. And this actually, uh, you won't find in Berlin. In Berlin, it looks very, very different. It comes as a sandwich. And this was invented by this guy over here in 1972. He was a Turkish immigrant um, that came to Berlin in the 60s. And, and he started uh, his own uh, small business. He started serving Duna as a, a sandwich. And that's actually, I mean, today you can eat all of but that's actually also something that started in Berlin. I don't know where is the child, but if you can at least mute your microphone, thank you. Uh, and this is, as I said, not considered to be. Um, this is not considered to be. Uh, Guy, you can mute everyone. Like no, I can't. Carney can. Carney, you can mute everyone. Sorry, Just don't unmute me. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, 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 so. I don't know what I feel about muting kids, uh, if it's legal or not, or uh, it's a startup. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Maybe you can design an application for life. <laughs> yeah, I'll develop that. So, um, so uh, Dona in Berlin, it's served in a bread and it's served with, uh, uh, with red cabbage. Why red cabbage? Because we, had a lot, we have a lot of it in Berlin and it's very, very cheap. And cheap was the name of the game. I mean, that's the reason why they came up with the idea, because it's such a uh, cheap uh, dish. If you would go to <laughs> Turkey and you would ask for a dinner with red cabbage, I'm not responsible for the reaction you will get, actually, uh, because this is something you are not, uh, this is really a no-go in uh, Turkey. This is a very German thing and especially a Berlin thing. And how many... Uh, let's talk about statistics from uh, Donner in Berlin. We, were we talked about uh, the sausages. Let's talk about uh, the Donner. So 1,600 shops in Berlin in 2016. I guess there are a bit more now, uh, but that's the statistic I have. 400,000 a day. Uh, before we talked about the sausages, we talked about 10,000. So 40 uh, times more. Uh, dishes are sold in a day. And here you can see a German icon, uh, Angela Merkel, the uh, counselor, the German counselor. And every, I mean, I don't, in Israel at least, when uh, before the elections, the uh, politicians, they always go to the market and they, uh, they do the photo op in the market because they want to show how uh, close they are to the people and how, um, how good they are with this uh, being easygoing. Angela Merkel is always going to Kreuzberg, Kreuzberg in Berlin, and they always take the same picture of her standing with the, uh, with the mid school. And you always see, I mean, it's never, it's always the same. I mean, she is not very, she is not able actually to hold the knife as she should, <laughs> but it always looks funny. Uh, the only difference I think is the color of the suit, but it's all, it's the same suit basically, just different colors. How much does it cost, Itai? How much is a... Uh, it's about, well, it's about 250 to 4 euros, let's say, if it's pricey. You can even get dinner for 1 euro. Uh, I always tell my uh, people who come with me on a tour, don't, never eat uh, dinner for 1 euro. Because if it costs 1 euro, just imagine how much the okay. meat costs to produce it. Mm. And it's, 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 it's street food? Is it called street food? It's, it's, it's considered to be a street food in, in Berlin most of the time. 
uh, we have more and more now. I mean, it becomes also, I mean, we have more and more uh, fancy places or more, um, uh, a bit more uh, high-end places. Also that we have already uh, a place, it's like, it's called Dollar with an Attitude and they serve uh, dinner for 650, which in Berlin is considered to be quite high for, uh, um, for a dinner. Uh, here you can see the four, um, the four um, biggest uh, immigrating uh, communities in Berlin. Um, one is the, the Turkish, the Turkish uh, migrants, they came to Berlin as uh, um, working uh, immigrants in the 60s and 70s to uh, West Berlin. And the same goes for East Berlin with the Vietnamese community. There's a very big Vietnamese community, uh, Don Juan Center, is a very big uh, center for um, Vietnamese uh, shops. Uh, if you need to make Vietnamese food and you are strict about your ingredients, you just go there. I mean, because this is the place where you can really get the most decent uh, things. And of course, we have also, after the uh, problems in the, in the Middle East, we have a lot of people from the Middle East, not just Israelis, also Lebanese, uh, but especially Syrians in the last years. Um, I want to, I mean, one of the um, revolutions that Berlin is, um, um, that passes in Berlin in the, in the recent years is the food. Uh, food becomes much more important, as I said, in the last 20 years, but let's say even more accurate from 2012. I mean, there's a lot of more, a lot more uh, um, decent food coming to Berlin, especially from um, from immigrants. Because if before uh, you could serve um, the donor with red cabbage because it's cheap and that's what German knows, so today we have much more authentic uh, immigrants' food. Uh, you can see it especially with the Italians. On the left side, I put the traditional Italian places from the 70s. They always look the same with the red, uh, white uh, stripes on the, um, on the um, tablecloth. Lee, are you there, by the way? You still here? And, and uh, Eyal also. Uh, Eyal, how many uh, restaurants in Italy in Florence, for example, did you see with this kind of uh, tablecloth? I mean, with the red and white? Only in America. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in other places which are, with, I mean, where, where you have ridiculous Italian uh, restaurants, because nobody in Italy eats like that. I mean, maybe, maybe if, if you are in Napoli or... Yeah, in, yeah, in the south, a little bit. Yeah, but, but uh, this, is the, uh, this is the standard of how Italian should, should look. I mean, uh, so it's, but it's very ridiculous. And on the right side, you can see the difference. I mean, that's the new Italian places, for example, and you see the difference is even with the pizza. Because, I mean, pizza, as it looks on the left side, that's, that's not how pizza looks in Italy. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it looks very... <laughs> I, I mean, it, for me, it looks sad. And on the right side, it's uh, one of the new trendy places. Uh, so food becomes... I think in general, in the world, food becomes much more now authentic and people are looking for the authentic feeling and not now the, um, what they have in mind about what is Italian or Arabic or Israeli food. Um, I'm going to skip a bit, but these are some um, examples for, um, for food, uh, for street food from the recent years. Um, as I said, from 2012, street food became a quite a hip thing in Berlin. And this is the most uh, competitive uh, sector today. Not the restaurant, but mostly street food stands because this is really, really vibrant. Sorry? What is that thing in the cone? In the cone? That's um, kind of, a, that's an ice cream made in a waffle mm. with... I even don't know how to call it. Okay. But, but I mean, it's, it's more this, the, in general, I think there's a wave in the world of Instagram food. So food which is not just good, but food that you can take pictures of, which is iconic. And That's actually the taste is less important. It's you like see it also in... Yeah. Sorry again? It's like the paintings. They used to paint the food. Now people photograph the food. Exactly. I mean, if you go to Prague, uh, for example, you will get uh, the Kariotush, 
which is this kind of sweet um, pastry, which is very traditional. And today they fill it with soft ice cream and then they put also um, uh, whipped cream on top. Mm -hmm. And this is like one kilo, two kilos of ice cream, I mean, you can put inside. And this is, I mean, who is this kind of thing? I mean, it's only to take the picture for Instagram saying, I was here and this is what I ate. But this, I mean, I have a lot of criticism about this kind of uh, food, actually. I mean, I think this, this is this culture of instant Instagram uh, food. Going ahead. Some more examples for fancy um, street food in uh, Berlin. Uh, I want to show you some pictures uh, from the tours. Uh, so I was talking, I mean, basically about, I don't want to start talking about all the neighborhoods in Berlin. I will talk about two neighborhoods. So uh, Charlottenburg uh, is one. Charlottenburg, the old, uh, old school uh, German Berlin. And uh, I mean, you can really see the difference by the type of food you can find there. Um, one establishment, a really good one in Berlin is, is um, Rogatsky. Okay, Rogatsky, um, 90 years old uh, German establishment in Berlin, family owned until today, and um, specialized in smoked fish. Uh, Berlin uh, in German, Germany in general, I mean, is very, very big on uh, smoking fish. And Rogatsky is the, is the most famous in Berlin for that. Uh, here you can see the smokery, it's quite a big one. Um, and I'll show you some more pictures from Rogatsky. Uh, Connie, if you, are, if you didn't take out the sausages, maybe you want some fish. Oh, it's not uh, fair because it's the, uh, the only thing that I cannot get here in Sweden. I become hungry uh, now. How did you know it? Uh, I hope you have uh, delivery here to Singapore because the first thing that you <laughs> me, Kylie, will be a uh, smoked fish. Okay, sorry. Yes, I cooked already my potatoes, by the way. So okay. this is this is one of the most iconic, and I mean, talked about if I talked about smoked fish. So the most iconic dish in Berlin kitchen is actually the eel because uh, Berlin used to be, as I said, a swamp and smoked eel is a delicacy, is a local delicacy and um, uh, Rogatsky specialized in smoked eel and that's what you can see in this picture, uh, that smoked eel. And I can say really that there's a reason why this is the, uh, the specialty. It's really the best thing you can have if you're coming to Berlin. So if you're coming to Berlin, this is definitely the place. Um, one more place which I really like is uh, Blomeyer's. Uh, Blomeyer's, it's a German um, cheese shop, which you can see here. Um, I will have uh, Fritz Blomeyer, the owner, um, on, on a talk in the next weeks, maybe next week or the week after, I still don't know. Fritz is considered to be the best, uh, the most knowledgeable um, expert for cheese in Berlin. I don't want to say in Germany, but in Berlin for sure. And his shop is really, uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing shop. He brings only German cheese, but as you can see, uh, very, very uh, high-end uh, cheese. He has very, very special cheese. Um, he has also some uh, other local products. For example, honey. Honey is a big thing in Germany. And you can find not just honey from Germany, not just honey from Berlin, but actually honey from the neighborhood. So they are located 300 meters from the shop. Uh, this guy creates um, 200 uh, jars a year. You can see the number. So it's actually, it's numbered and you can get, you can get it only on this shop. And he has, as I said, 200 jars a year and that's all. And it's quite quite good honey, um, and you can see that's another cheese. I will get to it later. But this, for example, is also from West Berlin, but from another area of the city. And you can see already the color is different because the environment is different. Honey can be uh, very very different between one area to another. It all depends on what the bees add to eat. Uh, I'll just get to this cheese and then I will go on. Uh, this is a very, very good cheese. It's actually uh, covered 
with the leftovers of the wine industry. So it's basically the gray, uh, what's left from the grapes after squeezing uh, everything. That's the leftovers. They cover the cheese with it, and then it's uh, been aged with this uh, with the leftovers of the wine. And it's as amazing as it sounds, actually. And it's made from uh, raw milk, so not pasteurized uh, milk. Um, just uh, going to Kreuzberg for a second. Kreuzberg uh, immigrants area. You can find a lot of uh, immigrants' food. Turkish baklava. This is a very, very good one. I mean, this is actually the best one I know. Made with pistachio. Pistachio, I mean, I don't know about you, but it's a, for me, it's a great love. Um, Turkish food, but real Turkish food. Uh, what else do we have here? Um, second. Some Italian paste, an Italian pastry shop, a very good one. She comes from uh, Genova in uh, Italy. And she makes uh, these small fancy um, uh, pastries. These are, by the way, quite cheap. I mean, Berlin in general is a very cheap city. This cost 150 for uh, for each. Uh, quite a lot of work for this country. And more Turkish food. And now we're going to talk about. Uh, um, we are going to make some food because I don't know about you, but I'm already hungry. So one of my specialties, I do also, um, I do also um, Italian food, I do also um, Israeli food, but one of my specialties is actually um, uh, fancy Jewish food, uh, Ashkenazi food, so food from uh, uh, East Europe uh, Jewish communities, because my region at least are from Poland, and I do, um, Polish Jewish food in a fancy way. I started with it a few years ago when I started also my catering, and it's it's uh, it's a thing which I try also. I mean, uh, I participated in a cooking book uh, with some recipes. Uh, this recipe, especially, I mean, the one that we are going to do now, it's also from this book. It's called Kreplach, which is the Jewish Polish uh, dumplings. Uh, here served in a soup. Um, what else you can see here? is the filter fish. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the origin, but the filter fish is uh, fish balls um, from carp, usually served not in such a way. Here you can see it with the um, beetroot ice cream on the side and with the cream fish with horseradish and some uh, fermented carrots on the side. So that's my fancy filter fish. This is all pictures from a Jewish Polish dinner club, which I did a few years ago. Um, that's duck breast uh, in plum uh, sauce. There's uh, tzimus on the side. Tzimus is the cooked carrots with cinnamon and um, and plums. And um, what else do I have here? And this is a compote. I don't know how many of you know compote. Compote is um, uh, compote is um, basically all the le the food leftovers cooked as a cold soup. Why is it stuck now? And here it's uh, been served. I basically deconstructed it, so the compote was turned into a jello, which you can see on the picture, and then there was also compote ice cream and some. A small cake on the side. The powder is um, hibiscus uh, powder. Uh, but right now we are going to make kreplach. This is from the book, which Carney also posted. Um, and we are not going to make the fancy uh, shape, but we are going to make the uh, shape as uh, we saw today. Um, anybody is cooking with me, or am I cooking by myself today? I'm joining you, Itai. Yeah, great. Tell me so carbs moving... and potatoes together with dough. With I'm potatoes. moving myself to the kitchen. Yeah, me too. First of all, uh, does anyone have any questions to Itai? Because yeah, Itai please, is... please ask. I'm convinced, okay? So I've never been to Berlin and I've been a few times to Zeefeld in Germany, but... Uh... 
too. This, uh, this curry hot dog, I'm coming. I ate it here in Singapore, but I want... Uh, okay, I made the stuffing already. I'll go to boil water. Here also. So the stuff's in. I made... I made already uh, mashed potatoes. You can see here. Yeah. And I did it with uh, fried onions, but I uh, some uh, butter inside. Yeah, yeah. great. And um, now we start with the uh, dough. Uh, it's a very plain dough uh, made um, with um, very, very plain flour. Uh, nothing too fancy. I'm using like the most basic flour uh, the most basic white flour and um, boiling water. So we have, um, uh, I'm boiling the water now. I hope it doesn't, I hope the sound is not irritating. Okay, did you say uh, two cups of plain flour? Yeah, we start with one cup ah, of flour okay. and one cup of water. And ah. some, uh, because I always forget that, so some salt. You can already put the salt, but it will melt uh, by the boiling water. And um, we stir it, of course, not by hand at first because it's very, very hot. We stir it with, um, with a spoon. So now you can actually see what I'm doing. You try to put the boiling water inside the one cup of uh, yeah. flour? Yeah. And if it's too sticky to start adding more flour? It should. No, 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 no. First, wait. Uh, here. Now I'm good. You can see my ball right now, right? Connie, you can see my ball? Yes. So I'm just like, I put one cup of flour, one cup of water, boiling water. And then I stir it. You know, Just it's like not that. like the Japanese gyoza dough. Really? Using, yeah, and the Chinese dim sum that I make. Uh huh. Are you adding a, an egg later? Ah, in bar is joining us yeah. today. We have a. Huh? a That's some time. In bar is uh, from a small village near Milano. Sorry, I don't remember the name. The tourist. Uh, She's also doing uh, cooking classes and uh, culinary adventures. So she came to learn about how to make pasta, the Polish version. Funny, <laughs> now you can you yeah. can add the other the other cup. Don't don't start with the whole cup okay. because uh, maybe it's too much. So I add like three quarter, half. I hope that everyone by the end of the night will show us some uh, trepalach. Now it's, by the way, also uh, not so hot anymore. I mean, you can also, I can at least walk with my hand already inside. Yeah, yeah. Should the, uh, the egg is for the stuffing or for the... No, no, for that. For that, for the dough. Now I'm going to add the egg. I mean, I've, I wait a bit that it's not so uh, warm. And then, I mean, I don't want the cooked egg inside, of course. Yeah. I just want to roll the sleeves up. My dough is perfect, so maybe I won't add uh, dough because it's too hot. Did you, add, did you add the egg already? Show I me. didn't add egg. I didn't add egg. Okay. So you see, it's but, I, but you're... You see, now, now I put the egg inside. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put some more flour to cool the better. The yeah. Yeah. So as you see, Itai is uh, struggling now. What we do now, I'm doing it also. Teaching how to make Chinese bun, uh, steamed dough online in Zoom. I tell you the challenges we have in life these days <laughs> of Corona is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can put, you can add like one spoon one spoon of um, oil inside plain oil. Excellent, oh, very soft and nice. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very 
Same if you before. don't, if you don't uh, have experience with O, this is actually one of the best ones to start with because it's very, very easy going. I mean, you can add more flour, less flour. I mean, it's really, I mean, now it's too sticky, so I add a bit more flour. But it's a very forgiving dough, I always say. Mine is ready. Yeah, it needs some more kneading, I think, like two minutes kneading. You can already transfer it here. In bar, you teach how to make a pasta with egg and without egg in your food tours, in your uh, cooking classes? Yes, in South Italy, we use the code. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, and it's nice to see you all. And uh, here. <laughs> yes, in our area, we, we are from South Italy. We prepare mostly pasta with uh, semolina flour and water without eggs. Ah. So semolina I'm without other flour, without wheat flour. Uh, I mean the no. regular. Oh, it's a it's a durum. It's a it's a very thick uh, wheat, and yeah. um, we use it with water, and uh, we make a kind of uh, the, the shape of pasta. It's usually. Orecchette, cavatelli, fusilli, and uh, this kind. Okay, so uh, I think we will have to host you again here in Foodies in Asia. <laughs> I would it's like okay. to. One day. Voila. Okay, I'm ready. Yeah, that, yeah, also, I'm getting a roller, I'm washing my hands, ah, and yeah, then we roller. start to do uh, this. I forgot to mention that you need a roller. But actually, if you don't have one, because I, I'm used to improvising when I'm cooking at somebody else's uh, place. So last time, for example, I did it and there was no roller. I used a, a bottle of wine. And uh, it actually worked even better than the, than the roller for me. So if you don't have a roller, use a bottle of wine. Meanwhile, we are kneading the dough. Is there anyone that wants to ask Itai something about his food tours? Uh, uh, when is he available after the corona? After the corona, yeah. So Let's do a small you... one. Yeah, okay. So. What are we doing now, Itai? How does the German... Uh, uh, what's the German approach uh, for a foreigner from Israel or just a foreigner that does food? Uh, well, Berlin is, as I said, Berlin is a very, very international city uh, with a lot of immigrants. So, I mean, uh, it's very, very common, I mean, to be uh, an immigrant in the city. We don't, I mean, we always laugh about it that uh, Berliners are a dying species. I mean, you don't see a lot of original Germans. Uh, in Berlin, especially not people born in in uh, Berlin. I mean, that's quite uh, rare. Um, this year I had a personal achievement because I guided two tours for a culinary festival in Berlin. It's called Eat Berlin. It's like a very traditional one. It's already, it was the ninth year that they are doing it. And this is my, I mean, the first year which I guided the tour and I did the, uh, all people on my tour were actually German. So I needed to do first, I needed to do a tour in German and not in uh, English or in Hebrew as I'm used to. But also, I mean, to give, uh, to tell uh, German people about the culinary history of Berlin, that was, for me was really funny. I mean, that I'm, as a foreigner, nine years after coming to Berlin, I give the tour to the Germans about the culinary history. Well, Itai, um yeah. I um I went on one of Carney's tours, and um, she was fantastic first. because I um <clears throat> I was born and raised in Singapore. I've lived here all my life, so I yeah. know a lot about Singapore food. But to see it from a perspective of someone who has only you know has lived in Singapore for uh, a, a lot less years, but who's just so passionate about the food and and 
finds out so much more than maybe even the locals know. It was so exciting for me. So it was pretty yeah. exciting for those those Germans to have you guide them as well. Yeah. I think, I mean, uh, the, the funny or maybe the sad thing is actually also that sometimes I feel that I'm more um, aware, I'm more educated about uh, German food culture than most Germans are. I mean, I can tell them about most about things that they usually don't know about, like with the potatoes, which I started to talk before. And I had a lot of time. I mean, I explained Germans about uh, potatoes types uh, because people today they are not really connected to this kind of things, and they're not they don't have the information. Um, I, I, I mean, you can ask more, but I'm just I just want to explain what I'm starting to do. So I take a cup, very plain cup, and I'm doing now the circles in the dough. I wish I had some meat to stuff them. And it's also, very good actually with the uh, uh, chicken from the soup. Yeah. That's the, I mean, because I my, myself, I really hate uh, cooked chicken from the soup. I mean, I can't I stand it as a, as a thing by itself. And if you put it inside uh, the kaplach, it's actually tasting very nice. So, so I, must, I must share a funny story that in Singapore, one of the most famous dish in Singapore is called chicken rice, which is a uh, uh, chicken that is cooked in his own fat. Uh, oh, like confit? Like, no, not like confit, confi because it's not cooked for a long time, but it's like a rich broth of yeah. chicken. And uh, at the end of the day, the fish, uh, the chicken that you see is very, very pale. Or like we call it in Israel, of mechubas. <laughs> of mechubas is a chicken that is uh, have passed the laundry. <laughs> that yeah. you you made laundry from the chicken, and then you get a white uh, thing. So uh, my guide Lionel one day he took a Israeli group <laughs> because I couldn't guide them, and he said one thing I learned from the Israeli guest: what is of mechubas? <laughs> The first impression then you, when, when I came to Singapore and I saw this of mechubat, I said to myself, okay, I really like it because I'm half Polish. So my father told my mother, just boil me the, the chicken in the soup. I'm okay with it. No need to roast, no need for uh, hoisin sauce or something like this. And uh, it's funny to see, but uh, it's not really of mechubat. It's so rich with flavors of garlic and pandan, which is a local herb and ginger, and it's served with chili, and it's really, really something special. So it's not only mechubas, but you say that we can use the of mechubas or the boiled chicken from the soup. Yeah, with some uh, onion, fried onion, I mean, it goes really great inside. Um, I used a lot of flour because I'm in a hurry. I mean, I didn't want to bother too much. Uh, so I used a lot of uh, flour. If you have a problem to stick it together, I mean, when you fold it, I will show you now. So you can, of course, use some water. I mean, to put some water over here on the corners and then to do it. Uh, it's easy. It's, I don't do it. I mean, you see, it's not uh, like uh, ravioli. I mean, it's much thicker. And um, I'm just folding it like that to half. And then I close it like that. And you see, it's a very, very easy way of doing it. And that's, I mean, there are a lot of ways how it should be closed and blah, blah, blah. That's the way my grandmother used to do, and that's the way I know. Can you see it now? I put it here. Can you see it? In bar the beside See, see, but show one little bit. Um, ah, okay. Because it was too much. Uh, Here? Uh, Here? Uh, the other side? Yes. Perfect. Here. No. Okay. See. Like that. So I just fold it to the side and then I just close it like that. And then these you cook in a chicken broth or you can cook it also in salt water about two, three minutes. I mean, because the filling is anyway cooked already. And wow, fantastic it. dough. Connie, how does it look at your phone? Show me. Can you Great. see mine? 
Yeah. Mine is already a gyoza. <laughs> <laughs> it's very relaxing, I think, to do these kind of things. And I have like, I did this also for bigger dinners. So I did it once for a dinner in the synagogue uh, for the Jewish food festival. And we had 100 guests. Each one got two at his soup. So we did about 200 um, dumplings like that. I think it's uh, it's very it's meditative in a way. <laughs> it's very. I can do it for a few hours. The most uh, I think that the most exciting thing about it it really reminds me some people from Israel, all my gra my friends' grandparents that made it. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's very good with uh, chicken liver. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That was our uh, like once a year. My grandmother used to do it with chicken liver after Yom Kippur, so after the fast, um, and that was a big thing. Maybe some like, of the people here don't know that uh, Polish food in Israel have sometimes bad reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I can say so, Itai. So. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's my job, basically, to make it fancy and uh, more appreciable. Because I think it doesn't, get, it doesn't get enough... Um, I mean, it's reputation, I think, uh, I think it's wrong. I mean, you see, I mean, this is really cute. In Bar, how is it like as a, as a pasta expert? I don't think you're all less than a, <laughs> as an expert than me. You were staying many years in Italy, so you have your hand. It's very similar for... Um, ravioli or other yeah. kind of uh, stuffed yeah. pasta. Yeah, but with uh, much more uh, soft flour. I mean, this is really, really soft. Yes, it's different. Yeah. And this, uh, so as I said, you can cook them. After you cook them, you can either eat them like that or you can eat them in a soup, chicken or vegetable soup. Uh, I like also to fry them after. You can fry them in a pan with some oil. With onion. With onion, yeah. it goes great. I, I know what I'm going to eat this evening. I also know what I'm going to eat. But why are <laughs> we doing? Why are we doing this live so early, late at night? My uh, here, here, in Europe, it's still 4:30, so we are fine. I mean, this is like still going. I mean, this is still makes sense. Yes, but I'm in Asia, and my kids <laughs> had a bad dinner at three o'clock, following the live from Israel with the fish. So now they will yeah. come back home and they will ask mommy, what's for dinner at 9, uh, <laughs> 10 Kreplach. Kreplach. I love Kreplach. Okay, so um, Itai, do you want to, uh, uh, to summarize? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me switch the view. Okay. Yeah. So um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Connie, for having me. I mean, this was uh, amazing. I, I have a strange feeling that I'm taking you again. So, uh, <laughs> More than welcome. Maybe we can do German food next time. I, I, I you know what that was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and Tom, thank you so much for being our followers. Bring your drink and your friends and join us next week also. We love it. It just makes us so hungry though. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, next week, I think we are going to have um, a Romanian food expert. With oh. some, can, la kebab? Mitete, or some uh, kebab. Uh, uh, mitete, I think, no? Something like this. Mitete. Something. Anyway, so um, stay tuned, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, walk and stroll, foodies in Asia. Itai, how are you called in all the social media? Elements of food. Elements, Elements of, food. of food on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. Um, you are more than welcome to uh, follow. It's uh, the website. I mean, if you write Elements of Food Berlin, I mean, you will get also the, the website. That's perfect, Connie. That's I mean, really nice. They don't open. I mean, that's a nice thing. It's a really good dough. They don't, they don't open when you cook them in water. That's the nice thing. And I'm not even no, using water. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Amir for Madrid. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you on our next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Itai. Thanks, Connie. Bye-bye. 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 See you. Thank you, Itai.
Ty. Thank you, Carney. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.